Hi, my name is Greg Sullivan, and in this lesson we're going to take a look at a scene from the point of view of a technical director. It's already been animated for us. We're going to add explosions, chunks flying around, cables exploding. It features our zero from the last lesson. If you don't have those files, they're included with this lesson. So let's get started. To get started, copy the files onto a place on your hard drive and set that as your content directory and uh, load up the scene. It's the only scene in the scenes directory. In this case, it's called uh, amp station attack underscore V008. It's the eighth version of this file. Whoever animated it saved eight revisions. So I've already got the scene up. Let's take a quick look at it. As you can see as we go through it, it's already been animated. The modelers have done their job. The animators have done their job. Now it's our turn. Watch it frame 60-ish. See that? That is a temporary explosion. It means something's going to blow up, specifically that little amp station. We're going to blow up that building. We're going to do a particle effect. We're going to do some hard effects, and we're going to do some cloth effects. Let's start with the particle effects. So I'm going to end the preview. And I've got my four views up here. This is how I like to work. The explosion takes place at frame 60. So I'm going to go to frame 60. Under items, I'm going to add a dynamic object, in this case, a particle. That should be called particle emitter. We call this main explosion. Hypervoxel emitter is what we want. Now, before I start moving things around, it brings up the properties panel. We don't want that right now. Before I start moving things around, I want to add a null. I'm going to call this null pyro kit. That way, later down the line, if we need to move our explosion, all of the different elements can be moved together as one piece. So now that we've got our pyro kit, I'm going to go to the main explosion, hit M for motion options, and parent that to the pyro kit. Now to move the explosions, we'll just simply move the pyro kit. In this case, we want it to be in the center of the building, so we're going to scoot it over. Don't worry that it's doing some weird things with particles in the, in the real-time views. We're going to fix that. And then I'm just going to copy that key to frame zero so it doesn't animate through the opening portions of the scene. So now we have a particle emitter. So at frame 60, we want some particles to explode. I'm going to set my beginning range here to 60, leave my end range at 130. P for properties. We're still on the pyro kit. We want to be on the main explosion, so select that. Go to the Dynamics tab. The effects emitter here is under Dynamics. And start making some changes. First, we're going to notice the birth rate is 100 particles per second. That's not what we want. We want it to happen more violently, more quickly than that. So we're going to change it to 75, but we're going to change the generate by two frames. So 75 particles will be created in each frame. I'm going to set the particle limit to 225. It's an arbitrary number. We'll probably end up changing it. Change the generator size to one foot by one foot by one foot, and the size effect to none. So let's hit play and see what we got. Right away, we only go through 10 frames and we can see nothing's happening. That's because we haven't assigned any motion. Let's go to the Motion tab. Under Explosion, enter 25. Another arbitrary number. Good place to start. We can always go up or down. I'm going to hit Calculate instead of Play. It's just a choice. You can do it either way. Okay, so let's go to the camera view and see if that scale looks even remotely close to what we want it to look like. I've set my 3D view to bounding box so I can see the particles exclusively. That's a little small. If we were to go back to wireframe or a shaded view, we'd instantly see it's not much bigger than the building itself. We want something more dramatic. Let's change the explosion to 50. Calculate that. Now that looks more like it. Lots of particles flying around, big explosion, very nice. Now, we want these particles to have some weight. So I'm going to go to the Etc tab, and under gravity, I'm going to change the gravity in the y-axis to negative 9.87m, or negative 9.87 meters. That's a standard Earth gravity. If you don't believe me, you can look it up on the internet. Hit Calculate again. our particles shoot up in the air and fall back down. Now this isn't 
iterative process, which is you make one change, it affects something else, you go back, and you make another change. I'm not happy again with our explosion size because the gravity's pulling it down. Let's add another 25 meters per second, bring it up to 75, calculate it again. Now that's more like it. It's starting to look pretty good. Particles flying all over the place. Now they're all pretty consistent with each other. Uh, that's because we haven't added any variables yet. They're all flying around and behaving more or less the exact same way. It's a little too cohesive. I want to mess things up a bit. Add a little chaos. Let's go to particle. Right now the particle weight is set to 1. Let's add a 0.2 plus or minus. That means the particles will now be a weight of 1 plus or minus 0.2. Uh, let's add another 0.1 to the resistance variable. So it's particle resistance is 1, plus or minus 0.1. That'll mess things up a little bit. Add to the, life, uh, the lifetime a number of frames, plus or minus 10. Calculate that again. You can see that is a lot less homogeneous. Things are moving around at different speeds falling at different rates, living for different periods of time. Looks pretty good. You might notice that when all of these particles get to the zero altitude in the y-axis, they're disappearing. This is because this scene has a ground plane in it with the effect collision set to it. We'll take a look at that right now. Let's select our ground from the current objects. Select ground effects. We're still under the Dynamics tab. There's FX Collision. Double click on that. And you see the mode is set to Erase. This is here so that when the bullets from the plane hit the ground, they're erased, as opposed to staying in the scene and eating up RAM. It just so happens that because they aren't grouped with anything, uh, they're all affecting each other, so our particles from this explosion are being erased when they hit the ground. That's a good thing. But speaking of groups, let's go back to our main explosion. And let's give it a group. Later down the road, we're going to want um, this to be in a group so that it doesn't affect other effects we're going to do. So if I add a huge explosion of wind in this group, and then later on we're working on the power lines, I don't want those winds to interact. I want to have separate control. It's important we be able to control one thing or the other independently for directorial purposes. If our director wants to change the speed of the explosion but not the reaction of the power lines, we're going to have ourselves a problem if all of our effects are in the same group. So let's add a new group. I'm going to call this one um, Main Explosion. If you drop down the group, you're going to see Fizz Effects, Explosion, and House Demo. These are just uh, physical effects from the animator who was working on the scene that he didn't clear out. We can ignore them. So now we have our main particles doing what we want them to do. Now, for those of you who are more familiar with particles, you might think our next step is to add some hypervoxels so we can see these particles. It's not what we're going to do. We're going to add, we're going to clone the main explosion by hitting Control C. Just one. Let's go to our scene editor. Under PyroKit, main explosion 2. Let's rename it followers. And let's parent it to main explosion. Okay, let's run a calculation and see what we've just done. Well, right away, all we can see what we've done is exactly duplicate our previous explosion. It's not what we wanted to do at all. So with the properties up, make sure that you're on followers. Right click and remove the particle dynamics. Now, why did we clone it if we're just going to remove the particle dynamics? Because we need it to be in the exact same place. Easy enough, right? Now, let's go in here and change the birth rate to 2 per frame. You'll see why we do this in a second. Change the generator size to 1 by 1 by 1. And the particle limit, let's change that to 10,000. Set the nozzle to object or to parent emitter. That means that whatever it's parented to is going to be used as an emitter for this object, in that case our main explosion. So what we're going to do now is have these particles emit from our previous particles. So of the 225 particles that we did for main explosion that are flying all over the place, if you were to track one of them, 
each one of them will be emitting even more particles. So that's why we set the frame generation to two per frame. For every frame, we want each of those particles to generate two more particles. Now, if we have 225 particles flying around, each generating 225 particles, I mean, two particles per frame, that works out to, what is that, 450 particles, every frame being added to the same. So that's why I want to like this small. So let's see what we've done here. Hit calculate. Now that looks pretty good. You can see some weirdness going on. We're going to address that. Hit control to stop the simulation. Go back to the beginning. Let's go over here to motion. Let's set the explosion motion to 1. That just means these particles aren't going to come straight off the main particle. They're going to explode off a little bit. Go to the particle. Let's add those plus and minuses back in. Let's make them a little more severe for this one. Plus or minus 0.5. Particle resistance, 0.25. Really want some variation. Under the Etc. tab, we're going to change the parent motion to 50%. And hit calculate. Now, why are they doing all that weirdness? Well, parent motion as we discussed in the previous DVD, is inherited motion from the original uh, generation source, in this case our miniature particles, our original particles. So as they fly through the air, their uh, children particles are inheriting all that motion and firing off ahead of them. We had set it down to 50%, it doesn't work, let's set it down even lower. In fact, I'm going to take out all but 10% of it. Now that's looking pretty good. I would argue, though, that it could stand to do with even less. You don't want to get rid of all the parent motion, but if you get rid of a lot of it, you'll be pretty happy. I'm going to go and set the explosion down to be just a little less. 0.5. Now that's starting to look really nice. If you were to add some hyperbolicals to that, it would take a long time to render, but it would look great. I'm going to set the explosion down just a little lower. And we are almost done with this explosion. You might notice that the settings are updating as you hit enter. Um, and I always hit calculate just to be sure that they were calculated correctly. Sometimes the computer will wig out and lose track of a couple particles. It's always best to you know, adjust and then recalculate. Okay, now the first thing I'm noticing is that those particles linger a long time. I think that's kind of a neat effect, especially if your uh, person in charge of hypervoxels did some neat dissolve effects. But I think it might be too long, so I'm going to hit Control to stop that. I'm going to go under Particle and set the particle lifespan to 25, plus or minus 10 frames. Really mix things up. The more variety you enter into this area, the more dynamic your explosion will be. Let's calculate that one last time and we should be ready to go. Now I'm starting to think that that's a pretty good looking explosion. Okay, one last thing to do. Remember earlier we had set our start frame down here to 60. Well that is not where the animation starts, the animation starts on zero. If you set that to zero, hit calculate, it's off the screen, but if you look down here you can see our particles are generating from the first frame. That's an easy enough fix. Go back to main explosion, Double click to bring up the properties. And under birth rate, we had 75. Let's hit E for envelope, bring up the graph editor. And on frame 60, where we want the explosion to begin, we're going to add a keyframe, set the value to 75. And then on frame 59, we're going to add another key. I just added a random key here. I'm going to change it to 59, value 0. Select the keyframe at 0, set its value to 0. Hit A to bring them all into view. And set the incoming curve to stepped. Okay, so now it's going to not produce any particles until frame 60, when it will produce 75 particles per frame until it reaches our 225 particle maximum. Now we can count on that 20, uh, 225 particle maximum 
uh, preventing us from creating more particles than we want. But to be safe, I'm going to kill the generation a few frames later. So at frame 65, I'm going to set the value to 0. Set the incoming curve to stepped. And there we go. So now with frame 0 as our start, let's hit calculate and see what happens. Looks to me like that's exactly what we want to have happen. That's a pretty good looking explosion. All right, before we move on, let's go back to our, let's go to our main explosion. And under file, we're going to save it. But instead of saving this motion here now, one at a time, we're going to go to utilities, additional effects browser. Now the effects browser is kind of a throwback to uh, Lightwave 7. It still has some uses here. I'm going to hit save. What it's going to go, what it's going to do is go through the scene, find all the different dynamics, and then offer you a save option for them. Um, wheel left is from the airplane from previously. Just hit save. In fact, you can more or less just hit save to all of these. The left gun and right gun are particle effects. Those are saved from earlier. Main explosion. You'll recognize that. And followers. Save. Now all the particles for the whole scene are saved. Close the effects browser. And look around your tabs here. They're all grayed out. You can change them, which is good. The control is disabled. We want, we have the explosion we want, and we don't want to mess with it later. Okay, so we can't mess with the particles anymore. What if we want to make changes in the future? Well, we would bring the uh, panel back up and go under File, and just say Clear Motion. Clear Motion will clear the loaded file and bring it back to a point that you can edit it. And then you would just save the motion again when you were done. Okay, I've gone ahead and rendered up the uh, preview. Let's take a look at it. All right, I think that looks pretty good. And that more or less wraps up what we're going to work on with particles. There are more particle tricks you could do to the scene if you wanted. You could add smoke trailing off the tracers if you'd like, or you could add puffs of dirt coming up when the bullets hit the ground. All those tools are available to you now. I just showed you how to do that. Just have to think creatively about it. Uh, that more or less wraps up the particles. Okay, so we've just finished adding the particles to the scene, and we had a really nice explosion. But if we watch the preview, you're going to notice there's something wrong. For a building that was just shot up and exploded, it's remarkably intact. And we're going to fix that. And what we're going to do to fix that is use hard effects. It's a new feature in Lightwave 8 Plus that's really nice. It allows you to do interactions, things like falling dominoes, uh, knocking over walls, all that kind of fun stuff that's usually a pain to animate. In this case, we're going to use it to blow up a building. But first, there's something in our scene that you might have noticed. Right there, for a few frames, is this big, silly, Batman-style looking explosion. The animator put that in for us to show us where the um, explosion, or when the explosion was to take place. So let's end the preview. Go to frame 60 where we saw that. There it is. Just grab it, hit minus, remove it from the scene. We don't need it. In its place, we have our very nice particle explosion. OK. Now let's take a look at the uh, victim of our pyrotechnics, our building. If you've been looking at your wireframe, you've noticed it's cracked, destroyed, and that there are two of them, one that isn't cracked and destroyed. Let's jump over to Modeler. Okay, that is our power station, underscore 001. So if you select that, hit A to fill the screen. See two layers. The first layer, very clean, very nice, simple building. Very, very simple building. And on layer two, a very destroyed building. Now, how would you have created this if your modeler hadn't been so kind as to provide it? You would have done a lot of Boolean work, intersections, subtractions, intersections, subtractions, and so on. Or you'd hunt down on the internet a plugin called Crack It, which does it very nice. You can find it at flay.com in the plugin archives. But our modeler is taking care of that for us, so let's go back to layout. And at 60, this building is destroyed. Fair enough. It's actually more like frame 63, the actual explosion would rip apart the building. Now, we want our broken building to be out of the way for the first 60 frames, and our whole building to go away after frame 61. Now, they're parented together, the broken building to the unbroken building. That's not what we want. So hit M for motion options with the broken building selected, and hit unparent. Okay. Now, 
go to frame 60 and create a keyframe. Double tap enter. Go to frame zero, move it underground. Go to the graph editor, select your Y motion there, and set your incoming curves both to stepped. On frame 60, our broken building will jump into frame, which means on frame 60, we want our whole building to jump out of frame. So just move it out of frame on 60. Go to the graph editor and do the exact same trick to the keyframes. Let's see them swapping places there. Exactly what we want. All right, now if you haven't done it 100 times by now, then you should save your scene. Hit Shift S, it does an incremental save, new feature of Lightwave 8.3, very nice. Okay, now let's blow up that building. Set your start frame to 60. Select the building. Hit P for properties. And under dynamics, add hard, as in hard effects. Double click, and it brings up the options. Okay, let's just see what the default looks like. Hit calculate. Well, that was anticlimactic. The default settings don't cause anything to happen. That's because no forces have been set. So the first thing we want to do is add some gravity. Down here under the Basics tab, negative 9.87 meters. Calculate that. All right, it fell completely through the ground. That's not what we want. Why is it doing that? Because there is no ground um, collision object. There is a ground erase object but no ground collision. So let's select that ground effects and clone it. Control C. With the clone up, you'll know the clone is up because it has a little two following it. Double click, effects collision, and set this mode to bounce. Now let's hit calculate again. Our building very nicely crumbles to the ground, but that's kind of boring, isn't it? Now, let's try something interesting. We have an explosion taking place in the scene. So, let's add some explosive wind. Okay, let's add a dynamic object. This one will be a wind, and let's call it explosion. Okay. Now, under wind mode, instead of direction, set it to explosion. Set the radius to 50 feet, and the power to 500. Okay. Now, we don't want this to be in the default group, because the default group affects everything. And remember, we have particles in the scene. Even though we've saved them, if we make any changes to them later, they'll be affected by this. So let's make a new group. Let's call this station demo, as in station demolition. Okay, wind mode explosion, blend mode add, size effect, wind. Let's leave all that right now. Let's go back to our broken house. Double click on hard effects. And let's set this group to station demo. Now let's calculate it again. Okay, now that's an interesting bit of uh, explosion we just saw. The wind isn't in the right place, so it exploded and it blew our house that way. Let's move the explosion into the house, roughly where the pyro kit is. Remember our pyro kit from earlier? That'll come back into play. All right, let's calculate that again. Okay, a couple things we're going to notice. First of all, the explosion isn't very strong. The particles are, the building is still falling straight down. Second of all, the explosion, or the explosive wind, just keeps blowing. 
So after they've fallen, they just keep falling. So let's add an animation to that. Now with the effects wind chosen, let's bring up the dynamics tab, and size e effect equals wind. That's good. The bigger the size of the object, the stronger the wind is going to blow. So on frame 60, set the scale to something very small, 0 0.01. The same in all three axes. Now go to frame 67 or so and double tap enter just to copy that keyframe there. Now on frame 62, set the scale back to 1, 1, and 1. Bring up your graph editor. Now you're going to notice that because we're starting on frame 60, there's a key as 0. We don't want that. Right click and drag over all of your scale keys and delete the frame 0. That way the wind won't start blowing until we want it to. Now let's calculate and see what we've got. Okay, so the wind blew when we wanted it to and stopped blowing when we wanted it to, but it didn't blow as hard as we wanted it to. So let's bring up the properties and let's set the power to 5,000. It's a big change, but sometimes that's what you've got to do. Let's calculate it again, see what we get. Well, that's pretty nice. Uh, let's make it even bigger. Let's change the power from 5,000 to 7,500. Now we're cooking with fire. That looks great. So, a couple things I don't like. This building has some weight to it, but when it hits the ground, it slides around like it doesn't weigh anything. Or more accurately, like the ground is made of ice. Who's the culprit here? Is it the wind? No. Is it the building? It could be. We could change some friction settings, but the easiest thing to do is go to our ground effects, number two. Remember, this is our collision object for the ground. Double click to bring up the properties. The mode is set to bounce. The radius level is zero. That's good. Bounce, bind power 100. All this is good. Friction power zero. No friction. Let's change that. Arbitrary number again, 50. And then while we're here, let's change the roughness to 50%. Roughness is how variable the surface is, how much it's going to vary. Let's run a calculation. That looked a lot better. See how the ground, the object stuck to the ground a little bit. They didn't just roll around like the ground was slick ice. Okay, that might be a little too much sticking actually. I'm going to set this down to 25 and calculate that again. I like that, it's looking good. Okay, now, another thing you notice when you watch the animation. Different parts of the building are different sizes, and yet they're all behaving like they weigh exactly the same amount. And that's a culprit of the settings of the hard effects on the building. So let's select our building, and with our building selected, go over here to hard effects, bring the properties back up, and next to weight and resistance are size effects check boxes. This means that the bigger it is, the larger a percentage of this weight it will have, varying from the smallest object to the biggest object proportionally. Same here with resistance. Let's set them both to on and calculate again. Subtle, but you'll note that the uh, Different sized objects are behaving differently. Let's go to rotation. Torque minimum and torque maximum. That just means how much power it takes to get them rotating. Let's turn on size effect and set the torque minimum to 50. Let's calculate that. Again, subtle, but it's what we want. Okay. The camera selected so that we don't have all that data in the way. And switching to camera view, let's render up a preview and see what we've got. All right, I've gone ahead and rendered up the preview. Let's see what it looks like. Okay, so we have the animation looking great from frame 60 to frame 130, but what about the first 60 frames? Well, with the particles, we set an envelope to uh, control the emission of particles. Well, that's not how this is going to work. What we're going to do is go back in here to 
the hard effects controls and go to file and go save motion. It already exists on my computer because I've done this before. It probably won't on yours. Just click OK if this comes up. OK, now you can't change your settings. If you ever want to change them, remember you just come here and click Clear Motion. But if we set the start frame to zero and go back, we'll notice nothing happens until frame 60. It's kind of using the uh, Save tool as a bit of a cheat, but it works great, does exactly what we want. OK, Shift S saves another version of our scene, and we are in good shape. OK, now, lots of things I kind of glossed over. Uh, different particle settings, different hard effects variables. Think of them as a, a kind of a sandbox, things you can play with. If you want to figure out what something does, get an explosion kind of looking right, and then change just that one setting. Be extreme. Try negative numbers. See how those affect what you're trying to do. If it doesn't get what you want, set it back to where it was, move on to the next variable. Great way to learn this. Uh, save often. Uh, dynamics tend to be a little crashy in any platform just because of their nature. So, the scene's looking good. Particles, hard effects, Everything's doing what we want it to do. So I think we're in a good place. All right, so if we were to watch this preview, we would see that our zero flies by, blows up the building, great particle effects, building flies apart. But if the goal of our pilot was to disrupt power to his enemies, well, the power cables are still in perfectly good condition. And that's what we're going to fix. Let's take a look at the power lines. Let's see what the modeler has given us to work with. Go to Perspective and select the power lines. OK. Switching into front-facing wireframe. Close this out. We can see the power lines consist of three objects. These power lines that go off into the distance. These front power lines, which are conveniently separated for us so we can blow them up, and a power pole, which we're going to knock over. So the first thing I notice is the power cables go completely straight. Now if we examine that by going to the Properties panel and go to Deformations, Add Displacement, I happen to know that there's a morph built in here by our modeler. Double click on Morph Mixer and set it to 100%. There's only one morph, so there you go. Okay, so these back lines look good. They're sagging. Now, could we just do the same here? We could, but we're not going to because we want those to sag under their own weight so when they explode, they behave correctly. We have some setup to do before we can start playing with this. Let's go over to Modeler. Okay, here are our power lines. Three layers, like I said. Okay, so we are going to use a pretty tricky little technique to get these power lines to animate correctly. We're not going to use soft bodies, which some of you might be thinking is the technique we're going to use. We're going to use cloth simulation. We're going to simulate them as if they were made of cloth, blow them apart, rip them, do some really neat things. But to do it more quickly, we're not going to simulate the entire cable. We're going to simulate a one polygon thick chain, uh, and we're going to animate that. And then we're going to use soft effects to, use, uh, to make the full-size cables react to what we did with our single polygon chain. So if that seemed complicated, stick around. It'll all make sense in a moment. OK, the first thing we want to do is isolate one of these power cables. I happen to know, because I spoke to the modeler who built this, that all of these cables are the exact same length. So we're going to create one polygon chain and recycle it. So select a polygon here, expand your selection with the closed bracket key, and hit the equal sign to isolate it. Those other things aren't deleted if you're not familiar with how this works. They're just hidden, so you can't affect them. OK, I'm going to change this top view to a front view, and zoom in nice and tight. OK, currently this is subdivided. And hit Tab to unsubdivide it. Right click and drag a circle around this top row of points. If we zoom out, we can see we got all the top row of points. OK, I'm going to copy that. Control-C. I'm going to hit the backslash key. That'll bring up the rest of our pull our uh, power lines completely unaffected. And let's go to the fourth layer. Control V. Okay, our points are back. This is not the most entertaining thing you can do in Lightwave, but it's pretty important. So let's uh, take a moment and select this point. Wait a second. Look down here. Selection. Two points. Okay, that just must mean that we're too far zoomed out to see them all. 
zooming in, reveals that there are in fact two points. Deselect, select the one on the left, select the one on the right, hit P to create a polygon. Now, scoot over. You might even want to zoom out a bit. Deselect, select this one, and select the next point in our chain. Hit P, create another polygon. Continue doing this until you've created an entire polygon chain. Okay, you're almost done going all the way down the line, and let's stop there, and let's take a look at these last two little polygon moments. It's like the other end. You'll see that there's these two little redundant, or really not redundant, but really close to each other points. Those are important, so let's just make sure we do them correctly. And there you go. Now, the proud owner of a single polygon chain. Okay, now we want to get up to eight of these, so let's put this in the background uh, by selecting the bottom half of our second layer square. Let's zoom in real close to our chain. Okay, for the point of performing as a proxy, we want this to be in the very center of the main cable. So scoot it down just a little bit till it's inside. Okay, zoom out a little bit. Select the whole thing. Hit Control C, Control V, T, and just scoot it over to the side while holding down the Control key. Holding down the Control key will isolate the movement to one axis so that it won't be higher or lower than the other one. So zoom in and put it exactly centered on the cable. Okay, we now have two of these. Now I can tell by looking, and also because I just happen to know the modeler, that these are symmetrical. So, with your front view, hit Shift V to bring up the mirror tool, in for numeric, and that will take care of the other two uh, polygon chains for our top uh, four cables. Now, select all of those. Copy them again, Control-C, Control-V. This time, uh, using Rotate, make sure your mode is set to mouse. Click somewhere around here, and rotate them around until they line up inside the other power cables. That looks just about perfect. Might want to zoom in and move them around so that they line up better. And I now notice that this proxy is a little high. So let's just scoot it down just a little bit, get it right in the center. Okay. We now have eight proxy cables running down the center of eight real cables. Looking good. Okay. Shift S to save your scene. It'll add a little version number for you. Here, synchronize layout and switch to layout. Let's select our cables, go to the scene editor, and for the time being, we're gonna hide them. We don't wanna see them. They will be directly in our way for the duration of this work. Okay, now let's select our proxies that we just made. They're gonna be at the bottom down here. Power lines V001 layer four. Already, I don't like that. Let's jump back into Modeler, go to View, Layer Settings, and let's call these Cable Proxies. The more clear your naming, the happier you'll be. And let's go back to Layout. Now we have them called Cable Proxies. There they are. Okay, now I said we were gonna use cloth. Let's very quickly add some cloth simulations to this. P for Properties. Dynamics tab, add dynamic, cloth. Double click. Let's go to etc. and add some gravity, negative 9.87 meters, as we well know by now. Let's set the uh, preset to cotton thin, one of five available presets. And let's calculate this. Okay, the cables fell directly through the earth. So let's go to collision and uh, set the collision to all. 
Now, if we recalculate, it should hit the ground. Okay, so they're already behaving like cables. However, they're behaving like cables that aren't attached to anything, and that's no good. Uh, we need to fix some points and sew some points, but before we can do that, let's, uh, we have to jump over to Modeler. Okay, so to be able to sew things in layout, we need to have the points set up in Modeler. So the first thing I'm going to do is zoom in here to the point where all of the points join the power pole. If we set the power pole in the background, we can see it there. These end points are what we want to sew to. So let's copy those, control C, and let's paste them onto our power pole. You're not going to be able to see them. They won't render their single point, but we will be able to sew to them, and that's what's important. Okay, now let's go back to our proxies and select the end points. Zoom in here. Select these endpoints and these over here. All right, now S for selection set, and let's create a new one. We're going to call it fixed. Okay, so we now have created points that we can sew to and points that we can fix. Save it, S or Shift S, depending on how par paranoid you are, and switch back to layout. All right, back in layout, uh, we've got our cable proxy selected. Let's bring up the dynamics for those. Well, here we are under basic. Now under fix, we want to fix our fixed point set. And let's run our calculation again. Note up here where we set our fixed points that our cables are now hanging from the power line. Our other fixed points are down here. They are also being fixed, but it doesn't matter. They're hitting the ground anyway. Um, it will matter later. But our middle points, our middle points are falling freely. It's time to do a little sewing. Uh, don't get squeamish, gentlemen. It's a new millennium. Zoom in nice and tight on the top of our power lines here. In fact, let's make it the only view we really want to be able to see what we're doing. Bring the properties panel back up, cloth effects, Okay, we're zoomed in nice and tight at the top of this cable. This is the one we're going to start with. Go to the Edit Effects panel. And to start, let's just scoot this cable a little to one side. Note the position. Right now it's at 0, 0, 0. We're going to move it a little to the side. Just a bit. Now you're noticing that it's not scooting. That's because we have cloth effects turned on and the Simulation doesn't, it has to be recalculated to acknowledge what we've just done. So I'm going to go to File. I'm going to clear the existing motion. And now we can get our control back. OK, so now we've got these two to the side. Let's switch to vertices under our view. And you'll see our little anchor points we set up earlier are now visible right here. Yeah, but don't get confused. These are the outside, and these are our anchors. We moved the cables just a little too far. Easy mistake to make, so be sure you're paying attention. Scoot this over here, get out of the way. So we want to glue or sew this point to this point, this point to this point, and so on. So under edit effects, so <laughs> clever. Uh, right here under objects, drop down and select the pole. This is the object we're going to be sewing to. Okay, now left click the first point, then the second point, and then come down here under your edit effects. Now Leave event at none, but keep this drop down in mind. We're going to be working with it later. And click sewing. Those two points are now sewn together. We'll do another one just to see how you do it. Left click the first point, left click the second point, click sewing. Now I'm going to close this, go back to our quad view, and run the simulation to see if we've accomplished what we wanted to accomplish. Those two cables should stay up, the rest should fall. OK, that's exactly what we wanted to see happen. Um, there's obviously a lot of things going on that we need to fix later, like the sagging of the cables. But uh, one thing at a time, let's finish sewing those points together. 
All right, I finished sewing together the remaining six cables, and we're going to run a quick calculation. And we can see that although the cables aren't behaving like we want them to, they're hanging from where we want them to. So let's deal with that sagginess. Now, to save ourselves a little bit of time, we're going to set our end frame to 60. We don't need to see all the particles rendered out to see if this is working or not. Let's start under advanced. We want the stretch limit to be much lower. Now, right now it's set to 30. I'm going to set to zero. Now, quick bit of information on the uh, stretch. The more stretch limit you've got, the more it will stretch. Theoretically, you set the value of zero, the cables won't stretch at all. It's bogus. I don't know if it's broken. I don't know if it's working as somebody somewhere thought was right. But you can't set a zero stress, a stretch, and have it not stretch. So we're going to have to do some tricks, and let's uh, see what those are. To prove my point, we're going to set the stretch limit to zero. Theoretically, those cables shouldn't stretch at all and shouldn't move. Run calculation. Watch cables plummet, as if we didn't change anything. Interesting. So let's go to the basics tab, and let's set a substructure. Substructure just adds a little bit of rigidity to things. I'm going to set it to 4,000. Calculate again. A little better, still not what we want. Let's go to polygon size. Set the polygon size to 80%. This helps the stretch limit kind of work. It shrinks the polygons and uh, allows us to get a little more what we're looking for. And that's getting much closer. Now, let's notice that by frame 60, we haven't completely relaxed the polygons. The proxies are still moving around. And now if we were to run our entire animation, set this back to 130, calculate the whole thing, our cables would still be prepping for animation when the animation started. So how do we solve that? It's time to introduce you to the wonderful world of negative frames. They exist and we should embrace them. Let's set our start frames to negative 200. Now, this gives us 200 frames to work in and it's called pre-roll. Now, oftentimes dynamics need time to settle into themselves before you start the animation and most animators start working at frame zero. So how do you get the cloth on a character to relax or our cables to be hanging like they're supposed to before the animation starts? You work in negative frame space. Negative 200 through zero or negative whatever we'd like through zero is our space to work in that will not affect the animation. So starting at frame negative 200, let's set the end frame to zero. Let's only work in our pre-roll space. And let's calculate that again. Cables are settling down. And now if we go to frame zero, we can see they're sagging relatively acceptably. But if you look down here, they're sagging more than their next nearest counterpart. Still unacceptable. Let's shrink the polygon size down to 70. We don't want to go much more than that or it'll affect the animation in a negative way. Now that's getting pretty close. Set the compressed stress to 100. Now what is compressed stress? I'm setting it in 100 in anticipation of the future, but compressed stress is cloth compressing onto itself. Instead of just shrinking, it'll now fold out of its way, giving it a little more realism. If it was a stretchy object or something that we didn't need to be very realistic, the cloth could just shrink into itself, and in this case it'll push itself out of the way. It's something we want to have happen later down the road. Let's go to basic. Let's set our spring value up maybe to 3,000. Higher spring values mean a little more fixed. Let's calculate that again. Very, very close. It's getting closer every time. But let's set the resistance now, and this is the resistance to animation, to two, let's double it, see if that gives us what we want. Too subtle, but we're very close. Let's set this to four. By gum, I think we've got it. Now, it's sagging more than these are sagging. There's several fixes. We can ignore it. It's our discretion. We can continue to tweak with settings to get it to do what we want it to do. We could lessen the weight, but we don't want to do that. It'll fall in unrealistically later. We could set these morph targets to greater than 100 to morph them down further. 
I think that in a scene with the camera moving as much as it is, no one's going to notice the extra couple moments of droop, so I'm going to ignore it. You can choose to fix it if you'd like. Just experiment with all these different settings. So, setting the end frame to 130 where our animation ends, but we're not going to touch our pre-roll. If we were to take out the pre-roll and, and then calculate, it'd eliminate the point of having the pre-roll. So with pre-roll still in place, let's calculate. The idea is that by frame zero, the pre-roll animation will have settled down enough. Now the animation starts. And there you go. Okay, so the explosion happens and these little cables don't react at all. That's obviously a mistake. So we have some explosive wind in the scene, but it's part of a different group. Just as a quick experiment, let's change the group of our cable from default to main explosion. Okay, now nothing happened. I did that on purpose. Illustrate a point. Particle explosions don't have force. They, pre they create their own force. Wind that is part of the station demo group, now that's creating an actual force. So if we were to set it to station demo group and run the calculation, Ex okay. That's pretty exciting. At frame 60, the building explodes and flings those cables all over the place. Way too much stretch, way too much going on. Basically, the explosion is too powerful for our little cables. So let's select the main explosion and turn down the power. Oh, if we do that and we have to do any tweaking to the simulation, the building will explode differently. That's unacceptable. So let's instead choose our explosion which is our wind effect, clone it once. We now have two explosions. Select the second one, bring up its effects properties, and let's put it in a new group. Let's call this cable explosion. Now let's select our cable proxies. bring up their properties, set their group from station demo to cable explosion, calculate the scene again. Note that by frame negative 100 our pre-roll is finished, so we could lose 100 frames from the pre-roll. Okay, the cables explode. That's good. They still explode too violently, but now we've isolated the wind that's affecting them Explosion 2, and we can turn that power down from 7,500. Let's turn it way down to 1,000 and run that simulation again. I'm going to take 100 frames out of the pre-roll because I happen to have noticed that we can do that. We're not using all of our pre-roll. Hey, that's pretty slick. The explosion starts to happen on frame 60, and our cables react to the wind very nicely. Okay, this is an excellent time to save your scene and all of your objects. In our own isolated group now, our cables are whipping around in the wind. That's kind of cool. We could call this scene done, but I think I want to take it a little further. I want to knock down that telephone pole, and I want the cables to snap and break. That involves some more sewing, and then some cutting, and that also involves a little bit of time back in Modeler. So let's go over to Modeler. Okay, shift select layers 2 and 4. We now have our main cables. Don't forget they exist. We need them and we have our proxies underneath. On the background layer, let's set our power pole. Okay, the explosion's happening in our layout somewhere around here. Power's exploding, and damage and chaos are going on. So I'm gonna select with the right mouse just the cables in this area. Basically, 
these are the cables I want to break away from the other cables. Now that looks pretty symmetrical, perfectly aligned on both sides. It's, in fact, it's bad because if it were to break like that, everyone would scream, you know, hey, that's computer animation. Chaos and confusion are ways to uh, break that illusion. So I'm going to expand these selections a little bit, just shifting and clicking and growing the selections on either side, mixing it up, making some longer than the other. Now a neat little trick to make sure you got all the polygons you needed to get is to expand your selection with shift open bracket once or twice and then shrink it back down. If you had missed any polygons on the side, they're there now and they'll be fine. You can even get in, take a look, make sure everything's where you want it to be. Okay, now I'm going to cut these. Control X. Nothing should be left in those spaces. Go to a fifth layer. This is temporary. I'm going to paste them in here. Okay, so now we have two different prod objects. Kind of our upper cables and our lower cables. I'm going to get rid of, zoom in close here, get, get rid of our main cables. And by get rid of, I mean hide. I shouldn't say get rid of. Expand the selection and hit minus to make them disappear for a moment. Select your, the other part of your uh, proxy cables. You can now see highlighted in white are our upper cables, upper cable proxies, and our lower cable proxies. Okay, let's go to a top view and do some quick manipulation. Select the outermost points. And create a new morph target under here. M for morph, new. And call these offset. Just move them slightly to the side. Remember how we shifted the entire cables over so we could do some sewing? Well, these are going to end up being all part of the same object, so we can't shift them independently. So that's where the morph target comes in. Save your model. Okay, and now take the proxies from the fifth layer, cut them, and paste them back into your fourth layer. Now, let's go to the base morph target. See how they line up perfectly? Excellent. Okay, now back on our fifth layer, select the backslash, bring up our model there. Carefully select the end set of polygons. On all of your cables. If you get extra, use control to unselect them. Expand your selection once or twice, just make sure you got everything, and then shrink it back down. Now invert your selection. This is the single, uh, the double quote key, so shift quote, and cut these. And paste them back in with the rest of your cables. This leaves gaps where the cables can break. Now we're going to have to figure out a way to fill those gaps. That's what these remaining pieces on this layer are for. So save your model again. And before we jump over and uh, realize our mistake there, let's fix it and go into layer settings and name our fifth layer uh, cable gaps. Cable gaps, cable gap filler, whatever you want to name it, that'll help you remember what this is. Save again, switch to layout. If your computer behaved as well as mine and survived the transition back, save your scene. Okay, then let's take a moment to talk about our main cables that have been hidden this whole time. You can see our gap fillers are here. They haven't been hidden yet. Bring up a graph editor, a scene editor, and uh, unhide your cables. Now, while our proxies are animating underneath, our main cables are not. If we were to run a dyna the, the dynamic simulation for the proxies, you'll note the main cables completely ignore them. You'll also no notice our cables break. That's nice. That's what we wanted them to do. And then they explode all over the place. Also nice. Also what we wanted them to do. But our, prox our main cables didn't do anything. So let's select, uh, bring up a scene editor, 
And let's start by taking our cables and parenting them underneath our cable proxies. Do the same with the uh, gaps, the power line cable gaps. And change the colors here to match the other ones if you'd like. Now select your cables, close the scene editor, and let's go under deformation. This is a great new plugin. It's called uh, MetaLink. And what it does is it takes the animation from the proxies and applies it to the main cable. So now if we run the simulation, you can see our major cables are now behaving appropriately. More or less. There are some tweaks we apparently need to do. But everything's doing what we want it to do. Let's do the same thing to our gaps. Okay, MetaLink has a smoothing function. You do want that checked. Also, go to your gaps and under subdivision order, make it last. Go to your cables, also make them last. This means that it won't be subdivided till after all the calculations have been done. Now there's some weirdness going on. We're going to have to adjust that in Modeler. Let's go do that now. Save your scene. Okay, so we have our gaps here. Now what this is going to do is fill the gaps in the cables until such time as the animation breaks them apart. Then we're going to dissolve these out. So we're not going to touch those. Our main cables though, MetaLink isn't liking the fact that this is all one object behaving against all one object with overlapping points. So we're going to break it out. Right click, drag, select your a little bit of your center selection and expand the selection so you have the entire group of cables. Control X. Paste them onto the sixth layer. Control V. Go to view, layer settings, name this upper cables. Save your scene, switch to layout. Now let's run a quick calculation and see what we've got. Okay, so the simulation looked good, but let's see how our cables are reacting to their proxies. Okay, you see here, it looks like these are still breaking are still stretching like they're not supposed to. That's because those are the gap, the cable gaps, the gap fillers we have. Those will be made invisible before the cables break, so that's fine. Our upper cables aren't reacting at all. They're not parented appropriately. Uh, you can see them here. Upper cables, there they are. Just parent those underneath the cable proxies. Change the color to orange. Optional, but keeps your scene nice and clean. Uh, bring up the properties panel for the upper cables. Go to deformation, and once again, we're going to add the meta link. Go to geometry, set the uh, subdivision order to last, and everything is behaving all right. Now, if you want to see what it looks like without those weird gap fills stretching, simply hide the gap fills in the scene editor for the time being. The cable gaps. Let's take a look at our scene. Simulation needs to be rerun. We'll just run a few frames of it. That's enough to see if it's working. And already we can see it's not. Those gaps are still there. So what's going on? Well, let's hop back into Modeler and take a look. It turns out we need to do one more ring of polygons to make this completely clear. So we're going to take this, these end rings of polygons, just shift select them all. both sides. Expand your selection a few times to make sure you get all the polygons around the perimeter. Shrink it back down. Control X to cut them. Go to your gaps. Control V. Now M to merge points. It'll connect all those points. 48 points. If you do the math, 6 times 4. That works out very well. Save your scene. Synchronize to layout. 
switch to layout. Now calculate a bit of that cloth simulation again. And we can see it's working. The problem was that we had too many points too close to these points. And so they were getting crossed over. We finally, once for all, solved that problem. This problem will rear its ugly head in a lot of different situations. You gotta think of creative ways to fix the problem. And this one was ours. Okay, so in our negative 100 pre-roll space, our cables are breaking apart. It's because we have to do more sewing. Let's start by going to the scene editor, hiding all of our cables. Selecting our proxies and going under the cloth effects settings. Go under file and clear the motion. We want to start over. Okay, run through the sim, nothing should happen. Let's go to deformation, add a morph target or a morph mixer. Remember our offset morph, add it 100%. You can see our little breaks have shown up exactly where we wanted them to. Let's go to a top view. Our top view is still in vertices mode from earlier, which works out really well for us, except that we can't tell where our breaks are. So let's switch to wireframe. I'm gonna zoom in down here so you can see better. Let's go to Dynamics, Cloth Effects, bring up the Edit Effects, and we're going to do some more sewing. Go to the Sewing tool and set the power lines from pole to cable proxies because we're going to be sewing to ourselves. Kind of an interesting procedure you have to do here. Select your first point and your second point. Now, wait a second, it's clicking back and forth. Whenever you're sewing to yourself, it wants you to use the right uh, mouse key for the second selection. So left mouse your first point, right mouse your second point, click sewing, but don't click it yet. Remember this events that we discussed? We want cut by event. That means when an event object hits these points, they will be cut apart. That's exactly what we want, set cut by event, and sew. And now, I always do this redundantly because I'm not sure which way it works and it seems to be inconsistent, set cut by event again. All right, now we're gonna go through and sew the rest of these uh, remaining seven cables together. Now here's the thing. We've got two objects we're sewing to. The cable is being sewn to itself and it's being sewn to the power pole from our earlier steps. So every time you click sewing, it's gonna default back to sewing to the pole. So you need to click the sewing tool, select the cable proxies, sew, and repeat. Rinse, lather, repeat. So your process is gonna be, select the sewing, the sewing tool, the cable proxies, right click, left click, Cut by event, sewing, cut by event. I've gone ahead and sewn all the remaining cables together. I'm gonna to run a calculation to see if it worked. Okay, that's looking great. Now, if it didn't happen on your screen, just go back and redo the procedure for the points that didn't work. Now, let's talk about cutting these bad boys. Okay. We've experimented with collision objects in two different ways now. There's the collision object that erases the particles when they hit the ground, the collision object that is the ground uh, interaction surface where the cables drag across and um, interact with and where the parts of the house bounce off of. We're going to do a third collision object. This collision object is called an event. When an event happens, it's telling the computer to do something. Remember how we set all eight cables to cut by event? Well, we're going to add an event that will cut the cables. So, let's go to dynamic object, add a collision, and let's call this line cutter. Brings up its properties for us right here. We might as well use them since they're in front of us. Set the mode to event, radius, one meter. It's fine, we're gonna mess with it, so you can just leave it. And close that. Move it into the house on frame zero, don't do it at frame negative uh, 100. And let's go to frame 60. Now, let's go to this, enlarge this side view. Zoom in a little bit. Key through the animation, one, two, three frames at a time. See the cables start to explode up. 
right about there when the particles start to hit it, that's when we can say the force is more or less strong enough to be cutting the cables. So let's add a key at frame, let's call it 65, just the same old frame. Let's go forward two frames and let's just make the event object big. We want it to completely and thoroughly envelop all of our cut points. And if you're OCD a little bit and you just want it to go away, now that it's completely enveloped all those frames, go forward three and shrink it back down to something that gets it out of the way so you don't have to look at it. Go back here, properties, calculate. Let's see what we've got. Okay, now, that looks really good. I've hidden the particles so they're not in the way, so if you're wondering where those went, the follower particles are missing. And deselect the cable proxies, select anything, I usually choose the camera, just so you can see what's going on without all those point selections. And you can see the cables are breaking apart very nicely and then falling back down. Okay, now this looks really good. Uh, the results can be a little unpredictable, and if it didn't do what you wanted it to do on your system, just go back through and re-sew them together, making sure that your events are set correctly to either none or cut by event. Okay, now, there's one more thing I want to do to this scene. Enough power to blow apart a building, enough power to cause all those particles to fly all over the scene, and to make these cables break. Would probably be enough power to knock over this telephone pole, which will add a nice bit of uh, action to the end of our scene. Now our scene ends at frame 130. Now I've chosen that number arbitrarily, but we're going to stick to it because if you are an animator working for a director, they might have a reason for it to end at frame 130, and it's not your place to decide um, to do extra animation. Now if you're playing as a hobbyist, feel free to add some frames to the end, but we're going to stick to 130. So at frame 60, the explosion hits. Boom. Okay, so let's add a keyframe right about Frame 65. Now let's go all the way to frame 130. Um, let's make it 120. And let's just rotate that down onto the ground. Knock it down. I'm going to start with rotating to about 90 degrees. A little less than 90 actually. Uh, I'm going to get 87.7. That's what I'm doing. Just to keep it above the ground. You could rotate it to 90 and move it slightly up if you chose. Um, it's just a matter of taste. And now, because I don't want it to fall straight back, I'm also going to rotate it around a bit on its uh, heading. So scrub that animation from 65. Looks pretty decent. I'm going to mess with the graph editor for a moment. First of all, at frame 60, I'm going to set the tension to be 1. That will stop it from rotating prior to when it, we want it to. I'm going to right click and select all of these points at 120 and make them a negative one. I want this to accelerate until it hits the ground and then just boom, stop. Let's see what that looks like. It starts to fall slowly, accelerates, smacks the ground. Okay, go to frame 130, hit enter twice, add a key, go to 125, and now just rotate it back up just a little bit on the pitch. Bring it, bounce it a little is what we're going to do. Let's render a quick preview and see what we've accomplished. Select the camera, preview, make preview. We're going to go from 65 to 130. All right, um, the timing looks pretty decent. The bounce in the end is a little quick. We can fix this all in the graph editor. We'll do this real quickly. I'm assuming you're familiar with the graph editor. So I'm going to move these forward to frame 110. Make these here, go to frame 120. And I'm gonna delete all keys after frame uh, 120. 120 and frame 130 
on the bank and heading angles. Pitch is the only one we want. Animating after that point. Tweak the continuity to negative one. Set the continuity here to negative one, or the tension to negative one. Re-render that preview. And while this preview renders, notice what's happening with the cables. They're animating all right, but they have nothing to do with the animation we just provided to the cable. That's because we need to recalculate. Falls a little quickly for my taste, but uh, that's all right. You can extend that if you'd like. Let's recalculate, go to object, select any object with dynamics, in this case, cable proxies, and hit calculate. It's going to do the entire run right now. Now that was pretty nice. Those cables go whipping down to the ground following that pole. Very nice effect. Okay, one last thing is missing. Save your scene. To give you an idea, I'm already up to version 15. If you're up higher than that, good. If you're up lower than that, you're not saving often enough. Go to your scene editor. Our cables are missing. Let's make them all visible. And let's take our proxies and hide them. Let's look at the scene and see what we need to do to get this to do to behave correctly. Okay, starting at frame zero, and we're gonna scrub through this. The cables look great. I'll make this full screen so you can see it. Cables are looking good. Our explosion is getting ready. Our explosion happens and things break apart. Now, all that chaos and motion blur means that we can get away with a little cheat right now. Our cable gaps need to vanish in the course of about two frames. Select the cable gaps, bring up their properties. I'm gonna to go to wireframe so we can see which ones we're talking about here. Front facing, my personal favorite. P for properties. Go to render. And object dissolve envelope. Add a keyframe, a value of zero at frame 65. And at frame 66, the value of 100. Sharpen up these corners by increasing the tension. Go to texture, camera, and you can see them disappear. Looks like our cables are breaking. In all the chaos, it'll look perfect. Okay, now that looked great, so I wanna see a preview of this, but first I need to turn on uh, a long lost friend are particles. Let's turn those back on. Make sure they're showing up correctly. They look great. Very nice. In fact, just to have a little fun, I'm going to go into the scene editor again. Go to our followers and set them a nice orange color so they look a little like an explosion. Excellent. Select the camera. Set view to camera view. And let's make a preview from frame zero to 130. Okay, so I've rendered up the preview and here's what it looks like. Our plane comes around the corner, lots of particles, dynamics. All right, I think that's a great looking scene. There's a lot going on. You've done some particles, you've done some cloth dynamics, some uh, metalink, some hard effects, all sorts of great stuff. So where to from here? Add some hypervoxels to those particles and render it out. Take a look and pat yourself on the back because it's gonna be pretty cool. Now, about dynamics, they're not an exact science. Gravity, we keep pointing out, is negative 9.87 meters per second per second on Earth. But who cares? This is an art form. Computer animation is not science. So, if you want the cables to fall faster, turn up the gravity, or turn up the weight, or turn down the stiffness. There's plenty of things to do and plenty of combinations to try. So go back into the scene, figure out what else you can do to it to make it really, really hot, and then uh, send me your renders. I'd love to see them. Talk to you later.